Hey guys, uh, thanks for tuning in uh, to Border City Rock Talk. Um, got a really special guest here. Um, as soon as I give you his name, well, you know his name because it's in the article I'm writing, obviously. But I've got Rick Emmett here. How are you doing, Rick? I'm doing great, Ernest. Uh, Rick Emmett, everybody, uh, unless you're, uh, and I say this all the time, it's going to be too cliche, but unless you're living under a snowbank in Canada and around the world, uh, you know who Rick Emmett is. Uh, music Hall of Famer, uh, Music Walk of Famer, Platinum Record Seller, author, writer, husband, uh, parent, um, everything included. So um, we're here to talk about Rick's new, um, it was released, I think, in September 20th. Um, his new book on poetry. But before we do that, um, I'd be slapped in the face if I didn't ask a couple of triumph questions. And uh, I know Rick uh, rarely gets those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, in regards to uh, the rockumentary, um, it's been delayed and delayed. Um, is there a timeline for it to come out? I've seen the trailer and I've been looking online for everything and I don't know. It, it debuted at the TIFF, at the Toronto International Film Festival, and we went and it, it was like a big deal, a red carpet kind of a premiere, yeah. and um, it was well received, and, and it, it, it was a, a, a relief to finally have it, you know, making its way to the public, because as you say, it got bumped and bumped and bumped. Uh, COVID certainly uh, threw, you know, large wrenches into plans, and then uh, they finally got to the point where uh, there's an edit that, you know, has made it to the, this is kind of, I guess this is it. You know, I'd seen some rough cuts. I hadn't seen the final until right. we were literally sitting there at the premiere watching it. Um, but here, here's the catch now uh, that uh, Crave here in Canada had put up the some of the money to, to get it made. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're and they're itching to get it. They would love delivery because it also helps them fulfill CanCon kinds of requirements. You know, if they get it, hey, great, they could start programming it and running it on TV. But the guys that made it, they go, well, hang on for a second. We'd like to try and sell it to Netflix or Hulu or somebody in the states. Yeah. So you got to give us time to shop it. So that's that's the current thing now is like okay we're waiting for the the banger films guys to yeah. shop it around for internationally um because that had been delayed delayed because of the covid delays about them editing it and getting it finished and all the rest so uh that's the final sort of uh thing uh my guess is it, it'll probably it won't make it for the last quarter of 2021 it'll probably likely be a Canadian release on Crave TV, first quarter of 2022. You know, but you know it it exists now, and and I, we just on Thanksgiving weekend I had all my family over, my kids and my grandkids and everybody, and they all wore Triumph T-shirts and we all sat around and I got to see it on a Vimeo link uh, the, that the banger provided for me, so it was great. My kids were, you know, and. They were kind of thrilled. There's a lot of four-letter words in it, so my kids <laughs> was like, "Well, okay, you know." But they knew that uh, you know, Grandpa was a rock star, so they, you know, they knew there was going to be a lot of shit. So you, four so the four-letter words are like nice, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I no, see. There's f bombs, Ernest. Yeah. Big, huge f bombs. All the, right, the, man. One of the opening sequences. There's one where. Um, Sebastian Bach is in his living room singing along to uh, a rock and roll machine. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, he blows one of the, he's doing air drums, you know, and, and, he's, and he's singing. And then he blows the cue and then, you know, swears really loud. So it's like the first 30 seconds I'm going, I'm looking around at my grandkids. I'm going, oh, yeah, well, okay. You know, Sebastian it's not Bach like they have... Yeah, I haven't heard it before. They've heard it before. Yeah, you, you never think you get that kind of a reaction out of Sebastian Bach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. It's fun. It's it, uh, uh, People are going to enjoy that documentary. There's there's yeah. scenes where, like, John Five is sitting there with his guitar, and he's talking about uh, how great it was to see the Triumph Fest Festival, watch it live on MTV when he was a kid, and how, you know, influential it, it had been on him, and so there's some really nice, lovely stuff in there that uh, 
but then there's some stuff too where it's like oh yeah the rise and the fall and the you know the 20 years of not talking to each other and you know so but you know in the end it's it's a story it's it's banger's version of the story Mm -hmm. and um, my memoir will come out I don't know, next year or the year after that. And then that, there'll be some things that are my version of the story. You know, so. That was a good segue with MTV because I just interviewed uh, Diggity Dave. Remember from Pimp My Ride? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. You don't bullshit, Rick. Well, anyway, <laughs> he was a big MTV celeb and I asked him the other day. I always, I always do this. Triumph or Rush? Rush or Loverboy? Triumph. And he, they said... Both of him and his wife both said triumph all the way. They they loved they loved um, uh, laid on the line and follow your heart. They remember that stuff. So um, yeah. diggity Dave digs Rick. Well, you know I appreciate that, and it's true that there's probably triumph was actually maybe a little bit more uh, popular in the United States than it was in Canada. Which is not to say we didn't have popularity here and didn't play the big buildings and but. Uh, certainly from a radio and MTV point of view, uh, Triumph got a, a, a lot of uh, airplay on MTV from when it launched mm -hmm. through to about 84, 85, you know. Um, and then it changed. The nature of MTV changed and, you know, the whole nature of arena rock music and FM, AOR kind of stuff changed. But for that period of time, anybody that was into music from, say, 78 through to about 84, 85, yeah, they in the states they'd be Triumph fans for sure. So, yeah, nice thing. We, have, we you know, it's it's interesting because Canadians, uh, you know, we're kind of known as passive and followers, and and that is so true, Rick. Because um, I've interviewed guys from you know you know the Killer Dwarfs. They made they made it first in Texas through a radio yeah. station guy, and then the same thing with Rush. They made it there, so it's almost like if you're gonna make it. You got to make it in the states and their market, and then Canada follows through, which is unfortunate. I, I don't think it, it's true in in all respects because okay. certainly it, you know you're colored by your judgment of like a harder rock kind of a platform. But yeah. you know if you think about your Bruce Coburns and and Gordy Lightfoots and uh, Leonard Cohen's and stuff, sure. uh, you know that there was always that as part of the Canadian fabric and then you could pick bands like say blue rodeo or tragically hip that were bands that had a phenomenal kind of level of success in canada and still enjoy it and you know it's not like they could necessarily go and even in triumph's case like there were certain areas of the united states where like california was huge for us texas was huge uh florida was a big big market but mm -hmm. You know, we never got a lot of radio airplay in places like, uh, oh, you know, like Colorado and, and Wyoming. And like we we hardly ever toured there. Uh, uh, like the, the Northwest was mm -hmm. not a, a, a very big for us. And we didn't get a lot of influence from Vancouver down either because here in Canada, we weren't anywhere near as big in Vancouver as we were, say, in, in Calgary and Edmonton. So... A lot of that has to do with regional airplay. If you got airplay in certain markets, you become big there and you can go and tour there and play and, and sell a lot of concert tickets. And so they're, they're, that becomes part of the fabric of people that lived in those regions of, of their soundtrack of their lives. But, you know, it, we, we would play in Florida and then we would, you know, go up around the, 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 the Gulf and come over into Louisiana. And, and there was like, uh oh, crickets like. You know, we couldn't sell a lot of tickets. And then you cross the border into Texas. It's like, oh, now we can sell tickets again. It was weird. It was like, it, it's just the nature of the beast, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll let you in on something, Rick, just to um, put your heart at ease. Uh, I don't believe Wyoming has a radio station. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Well, you know, I was trying to think of that, you know, the states in that region, like there's Utah and there's North and South Dakota. And yeah, like yeah. we weren't big in any of those places. The first place we could get a rooting gig would be, say, uh, Oklahoma yeah. uh, on the way down and into Texas, you know. So I don't have a map in front of me, but, you know, it's like <laughs> we, we did great in California and we did OK in Nevada. And then, uh oh, like now New Mexico and the, like Arizona. Yeah. I, we did all right in Arizona. I think Phoenix, we could always play there. But it's like, you know, as you're trying to route the trucks and get from one place to another, you're kind of going like, 
Oh, that's going to be a long haul. We didn't get any <laughs> airplanes through there, you know. So, right on. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Rick Emmett's reinventions. Um, last year when we talked, um, actually it was, um, I have to say to you, Rick, you were really gracious. It was the day after your father passed and you still said, no, Ernest, let's do the interview. So I've got to thank you on that. That was really, um, that was a, that was a moment for me. I really, I really thought about um, how genuine you were, but in any event, uh, um, my condolences. Um, Thank you. We talked about you coming out with a book on poetry. And like I was telling you earlier um, that I thought it was going to be like this little pamphlet. <laughs> Hell no. I don't know. how. When you uh, sent it to the publisher and it came back, how many words was it? There you go. Rick Emmett's. Uh, no, I, I pretty much delivered uh, what they printed. And uh, I had more. Oh. Uh, but I'd had beta readers. My cousin, Nancy Wood, lives out in... Uh, in uh, British Columbia and uh, a friend of a family friend of ours named Jane Christmas is a novelist and she lives in Bristol England and I sent it, I sent it to them and I said give me some feedback like give me a sense of what's developing here and they, that was very helpful for me right. to have people that were writers and were were you know um, also sort of versed in the idea of editing and so they made some suggestions and, and that helped me organize the book into sections. And there were some things I, I lopped out. And then um, my friend, Dave Bedini, uh, who plays in the Rio Statics, but he edits the uh, newspaper, the, the West End Phoenix in Toronto. Uh, he said, you know what? I, there's an editor at ECW Press, a guy named Michael Holmes, and he might be your guy. I think he, and Dave is, he's kind of hooked into that world world of writers and editors and that sort of thing and so uh i, I that uh, michael holmes and ecw had been neil pert from rush they'd been his you know his um, publishing house and right so i went okay that that seems pretty good and natural to me mm -hmm. so uh, i hit it off with michael right away and he suggested i cut maybe i don't know two or three poems out he went i don't think you need this this seems extraneous but he liked what he got. He liked the order that I put it in. Um, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to roll with this. So that was great. I felt like I'd found a like mind, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, like, um, there's, it's, I don't know, 100 and 200 pages, roughly. Yeah, it's not that. It's like 138 or something. Oh. 100, oh, wait. No. Wait, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> oh now everybody knows no it's it's only it's only like 100 and 112 pages oh, okay okay well i got this to see what the cover, cover looks book. like there there you so, go um first of all and we'll do this at the end where can people get it uh well ecw press loves if people go to their local bookstores uh, and, you know, COVID's lifting. So, you know, hopefully local bookstores are ordering it in and they've got some and you, you could order it through them. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, obviously you can get it at Amazon and, you know, uh, get it delivered to your door. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, there's the chains that have it, like Chapters Indigo, all that stuff. Um, so you can go to the mall and probably find it. And if you can't, you could say, hey, how come you don't have this? This right. guy's an incredibly hot new poet. Right, right. <laughs> It makes me laugh because poetry, it, you know, it, it sells even worse than jazz guitar albums. And I can tell you, from, you know, <laughs> jazz guitar albums don't sell very well at all either. Yeah. But, you know, I don't I don't have any expectations of a kind of a commercial success with this, you know, like and, and I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I'm All I really hope is that, you know, uh, it, it does well enough that they go, you want to do another one? OK, all right, we'll do another one, you know. It was, Which is kind of my, my recording career had turned into that anyways, Ernest. Like, yeah. you know, after I left Triumph, I made maybe three shots at mainstream stuff. And then I went, I'm just going to set up my own little label and I'm going to do my own thing. And I, I think I might have done, you know, 23, 24 albums, you know. Well, and it, it was never a question of whether or not we were going to make a lot of money. It was mm -hmm. just a question of, are we going to cover our costs? Or, you know, are we going to make make our our... our you know, our investment back, and then great, if we do, hey, well, they're good, we'll do another one then, you know, so, and I bounced around like crazy, like, the, the, the poetry book is called Reinvention for a reason, yeah, it's because 
you know, over the course of my life, I reinvented myself a lot. You know, I wasn't really all that sold on the rock star thing, mm. you know, never bought into that. Uh, I love music, you know, I loved, and I loved, it was nice to play big gigs and sell lots of records and write music that got on the radio. That, that was all lovely stuff, but it was still, it was just a kind of a, it was a gig. It was a job, you know, mm. that, uh, um, and I was trying to put what I loved into what I did. Um, but there's a thing there where if you sort of, you, and you can, you know, I'm sure people see this, people that are in show business and they've sort of fallen in love with the image of what it is that, you know, or this character that they portray. Right. And now they've become this arrested sort of adolescent. Yeah. And I was going, and I go like, hmm, you know, that's not me. Whereas when I see actors, that move from a role to another really different role to another really different role. I go, yeah, that's, that's more what my creative artistic character is like, you know, I, I'm interested in trying out different roles and, and, and seeing where my talent leads me in, in, in that regard, in that respect. So, um, you know, uh, I, I just hope we sell enough books. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, I totally get you. Um, your career has been based on doing it for a passion and, and not for the limelight, not for the, you know, notoriety, not for the, the, the million dollar mansion and all that stuff. Um, reinvention, it, it, how long did it take you to write this? And um, you covered everything from politics to, the, to hockey to um, life and death to grieving to soul searching. How long did it take you to write this? Uh, there are a few poems that would go back. Like uh, there was one where I went back through all of my notebooks and I found something that I, I when I was teaching at the uh, summer uh, songwriting workshop, mm -hmm. song studio, uh, maybe around 2007, I'd given the uh, students an assignment uh, overnight. I said, you, you know, you can bring back a, a lyric tomorrow about something. I don't care what, but, you know, well, well, let's see what you can write overnight. And I thought, you know, it's not fair if I force them to do it and I don't try to do it too so I wrote a thing so there's a poem in there that was you know literally based on that it was called Dear Diary because it was right around my birthday mm -hmm. when I was turning 54 so uh last year sorry last year yeah <laughs> no 2007 yeah oh yeah uh, yeah I'm 68 now it's oh. it, you know and what? and you know it's it's like a, you're on a toboggan on an icy hill. It's you're going it's getting, it's going faster and faster. And downhill, you know. right down the Humber Hill, right behind the the college. Yeah, exactly. Yes, We're crashing right into the little creek at the bottom. Yeah. Um, no, I. Uh, yeah, where was I in all of this? Um, Aging and and no. was before that. It was about teaching, and you gave your students an assignment. Yeah, so so the some of the stuff is is older, but most of it was written once I decided I was going to take a crack at it. Uh, I, I already maybe had I, you know a, a dozen things in my notebook as I was contemplating. Hey, should I maybe take a crack at this? And then it maybe took me about a year. A year. Um, yeah. You know of of. Uh, going back through pruning editing rewriting you know um but that's not that's not too long i think that's a, a, a fairly reasonable kind of a thing would um, it be something where you did a couple hours a day or sometimes you'd spend four or five hours and then uh, a week later you'd start again no i i tend to write once i get my teeth into something i tend to write every day i'll get up in the morning and sometimes i'll write even before breakfast i'll, I'll spend an hour or mm -hmm. or and a half yeah. uh and then in the course of the day i might revisit it for four or five hours yeah. i might go back at it again in the night for a half an hour or, or uh, another hour uh, i have a fairly good work ethic when i've got my teeth sunk into something right. um but uh you know sometimes life gets in the way you know uh when you like uh Right now, for example, here I am talking to you. Just did an interview with a guy I know on sound. 
oh, I've got a gig coming up in Meaford next week where I'm going and doing, you know, one of these talking head kind of interview things, which is to promote the book. When you get into these chunks of your life where it's about marketing and promotion, yeah. they tend to bite out from the time you could spend writing and being right. creative, you know. But, you know, uh, I'll give you some insight into how things work for me. A friend of mine, Sam Reed, who plays keyboards in Glass Tiger, right. Sam and I sat on the songwriters board, Canadian Songwriters Association board together for a while, and we struck up a kind of a friendship. And then it was like, I think, 1999. He he and I did a record in a huge hurry in the fall of 99 to try and make a Christmas record that we could get out before Christmas on each of our little independent labels. Right. Uh, and it turned out pretty good. We liked it. We got some airplay. We still get airplay on a, we did a version of uh, I Saw Three Ships that was kind of a Celtic thing. Okay. And uh, and it's, it still gets some airplay every Christmas season. So anyways, he, he, somebody pitched him on, Hey, do you want to remix that and maybe put it back out? And we talked on the phone and I said, hey, Sam, what if we did some new stuff too? Like, and what, you know, there's a whole catalog of Christmas songs that, you know, modern ones that we've never touched. But I got a friend that does a podcast, uh, 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 Brent Jensen. And, and uh, every Christmas I sung a song on his show. Uh, and I said, so maybe we could, and, and Sam went, oh yeah, that'd be cool. So, there's a little part of me that's been thinking now about, oh, what if I came up with a few little chord progressions and little ideas? And so I get my iPhone and, and get out my 12 string guitar and, you know, write, record a little idea. And, you know, I'm that's so there's a part of me that's already formulating that stuff, even as I'm doing all of this marketing and promotion and, you know, doing poetry readings and blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, I noticed. Um that you'd mentioned Gore Downey in one of your, uh, um, what's the name of that poem? Game Changer. Okay. Yeah. And just um, obviously Canada, you know, is <laughs> hip fans and uh, we miss Gore dearly. Um, what was that? Uh, what's the poem about for the viewer? That hasn't bought uh, the book yet. You well, it's, book, it's, the, it, the title is, is, you know, pretty uh, illustrative. It's it, like, yeah. When, when Gord got sick and then they went out on their final tour and uh, especially the, uh, the, the performance that they did in Kingston at the end that was broadcast nationally. I was in Regina at the time playing uh, like a classic rock festival thing. Mm -hmm. And I went on just sort of before dinner finished the guys in the band. We all came in. We were in the bar in the hotel uh, sitting around having some drinks and having our dinner. And that show was on because, you know, it was back east. So the time change made it so that it was right around dinner time in Regina. Right. Um, but uh, it was an unbelievable act of courage and bravery. Uh, uh, but also it was typical Gord that it had this, you know, there was no class clown. <laughs> there, yeah. was, there was no poet laureate or... or um, you know, court jester, uh, front man, you know, Mick Jaggerish kind of front man. Right. Uh, in Canadian history, there'd never been anybody like Gord. Gord was the most charismatic, the weirdest, best front man. Yeah. Uh, he, he, you couldn't take your eyes off him. And here he was in the face of death, right. you know, doing his thing, which, like, what a thing it was. And so at, at some points in that performance, he was like, howling in, in the face of death, you know, like screaming and crying and, and, and angry. And then, oh, now he's switched characters and now he's this little dancing, goofy, smiley, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah. how the fuck does he do that? Like, it's right. just so incredible. And so that poem is about me sitting there, being somebody who had, I, I fronted rock bands, I've, I've danced around, I know what it's like to be a court jester, yeah. but... Here was a guy that was like rewriting the rule book, you know, um, and it was magnificent and, and, and amazing all at once, you know. So um, that's what the poem's about. And just how much, you know, we were going to miss that, you know, uh, anybody that was. And I, you know, I can't honestly say that I'm a huge tragically hip fan. Like, 
their music is okay by me, you know, but yeah. I tend to be more, sort of more of a, you know, I'm looking for a little more frills and, and thrills from the guitar playing and, and you know. Uh, like Joel uh, Hoekstra, who I have tomorrow. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Joel is a guy that's, you know, yeah, he's right up my alley. Yeah, so and Cher and obviously White Snake, but yeah. Yeah, and Joel, like he can play anything. You could say, Joel, you know, play play this kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, like like um, he, he could handle Dream Theater, but he could also handle, you know, I don't know. Malmsteen. A, a Genesis gig. Yeah, and, you know, he can... He, he he would tour with uh, uh, oh who are those uh, guys from uh, Bay Jack Blade? Well, oh, he was in uh, Night Ranger for a while. Yeah, Night Ranger. That's it. Yeah, Gillis and those guys. Like Joel can do anything. So you know, but I was going to say like the the hip were more of a meat and potatoes kind of rock band. Yes. Uh, and more of a Stones kind of a rock band, and I was much more of a Beatles kind of a guy. You know, when okay. I was a kid. Yeah, more, more than the Stones, and and uh, so, but how can you not be a Gord Downey fan? G Gord was this, you know, force of nature. He was just something completely different. And I think the fact that I have a kind of a poetic nature, Gord certainly was a poet, you know, and there was that in him, and I admired that greatly. So, right. Um, just just one more thing on them. Yeah, I'm the same way with uh, the hip. They've got a cult following, but I mean, I'm I like some of their stuff. But my favorite song, and I think you might agree poetically, was "Nautical Disaster." Yes, yeah. Well, there, there, there's a few I like. I mean, I like "Ahead by a Century." That's a fantastic song. That's yeah. a really clever, clever song. And there's some songs where the lyrics you go like, "Oh, I really like this." You know, uh, uh, what's the one about you know sinking in New Orleans? That's a pretty good tune. Yeah, well, they wrote a song about the Sioux, Smartest Trees in Sioux St. Marie. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> That's it. So, yeah, you know, how many people can fit, you know, Sioux St. Marie and Bob Cajun into their, like, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they, they broke a lot of ground in a lot of ways, for sure. Uh, you, wrote a, you wrote a poem about um, your father. Um, with how, how long after his um, passing did that come about? No, I wrote that one. The one that's in the reinvention book was before he'd passed away, but he, he oh. was starting to get dementia and he was right. on okay. his way that's out. Right. That's right. Yeah, and it's called Ticket to Ride. And yes. after he's passed, I've written another one now, which is Ticket to Ride PS, you know, um, okay. that's in the one. wake of losing him. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, it, that was a tough one. Just because yeah. my dad, he hung in for a long time. He made it to, he was almost to his 93rd birthday. Wow. In the last, I would say, 10 years of his life, he was struggling. He had a lot of issues, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, for sure he had prostate cancer, which, you know, you're at an aging stage where you're going, well, we're not going to operate. We're, you know. They, yeah. So he had three or four things that were wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And then eventually he had this dementia where, you know, it wasn't really him anymore. There were things that... He, you know, he, he was just, he was kind of gone mentally. Yeah. And so all of those things make it tough, you know. Um, plus, I was the only caregiver left because, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, my wife and I, because my brother had already predeceased. Uh, my two brothers had both uh, died. So, um, you know, it was sort of on me to have to drive up. And then COVID came and it was like, oh, now, you know, going to an old age home during COVID was not fun. You had to go every week and get a test. So yeah, that you um, could go in to visit. So it was it was uh, it was an awkward, hard, difficult time. But um, plus, you know, I'll say this: when you're an artist, yeah. uh, you tend to be kind of selfish. You tend to be self-centered. You tend to be all about your own process and your own thing. And yeah. and uh, you know, my wife would certainly say, "Well, it hasn't been easy," you know. Yeah. Uh, but but. Um, that whole thing of having to become a caregiver for my dad, yeah. uh, it was a challenge. And, and it was something where I, I said, okay, you know, often the best parts of ourselves are the ones where we sacrifice ourselves, where we, where we have to give up uh, our, our own sort of vanity yeah. in order to be in the service of others, you know. And that's a part of the, the poetry. It was one of the things 
things I was writing about. And of course, I come from here. I mean, here I am sitting in a room with all my gold records and my guitars, and you know. Yeah. So it's like, hey, look at how vain I am, you know. Uh, um, you're not vain. I don't believe yeah. that one bit. Well, you know, it, but it's something that I think we all struggle with, you know, in our lives. Mm -hmm. And and so a lot of the poems they're dealing with that dynamic of. So if you were this, you know, court jester dressed up in spandex pants, and that was, you know, who you were in your life. And now here you are, you know, in, in the, heading into the last chapter of your life and you're caring for your aging father. And, and there's, you know, you got grandkids that are being born. Like, what's that all about? That, that you know, that timeline, that, that, that arc of, yeah. of life, uh, you know, how do you deal with that in, in, in terms of, you know, trying to write poems that other people might find interesting? So, you know, um, and I, that's part of it, too, is the writing of poetry. I still see it as kind of public service. It's not just a question of, hey, look at me, look what I can do. Yeah. It's kind of like the writing of songs, the writing of poetry. It's kind of like, hey, can you find something in this that, you know, you might be of value in your life, you know? Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's like, it's, it's if you were maybe a minister to a congregation or something, you know, which... I don't want to get religious because I don't really buy into religion in any respect. Yeah. My religion is 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 art, is music. Yeah. You know, that's my religion. So right, um, soapbox sermonettes. Um, explain that. Uh, well, you know, I tend to be the kind of guy that you know, sitting at the uh, dining room table with my kids, mm -hmm. I would push the conversation into discussions of politics and religion, and and my kids would say, "Oh, Dad." Shut up, you know, go write a book, like, you know, uh, and, and um, I, I, you know, I taught for 20 years at a college. And so, you know, I would, the beginning of the week, I would, you know, go into the classrooms and, 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 and get up on my hind legs and bark and get up on my soapbox and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, lecture. And then, you know, uh, Thursday, I'd, I'd climb on a plane and fly somewhere and start playing gigs on the weekends, you know, so, yeah. uh, a soapbox sermonette is me sort of deciding, okay, here's a topic that I want to, you know, pontificate about. Right. And, uh, you know. Would you like me to read a poem? You know what? I was, I was definitely, that was on my list. And, and before we get you to do that, I was just curious, are you going to be doing anything? On the, I know you're not touring anymore, but um, are you going to do anything like a dead poet society where maybe you do readings where you go and... Uh, yeah, I've done some. I did some with the other two ECW poets, uh, George Murray and Adam Saul. Uh, okay. And so that's online. People can find that. Uh, it was a, I don't know what they called it, you know, a summit or a, a poetry summit or something. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like I, I'm going to be in Meaford, Ontario uh, next Tuesday. And I'm sitting down with a guy named Cameron Smiley who sort of interviews you. And then... Uh, yeah, like there'll be some poetry reading. There'll be some discussion about the book. I'll do a meet and greet after and sign them. We're doing that again in Guelph, Ontario on uh, November 19. I'm doing one there. So, yeah, there's going to be some of that stuff. And as I've been doing these Zoom interviews, I've been offering, hey, would you like me to read something? So, yeah. Well, I was going to say, you're doing the small markets, Meaford and Guelph. No offense, just kidding. But uh, maybe we'll get you up here in the Zoom, maybe at the Canuck. Yeah, that it, that's a possibility. Uh, it, it, if if it can be worked out, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do it. Great. Uh, right now, I have a cold and I need to blow my nose. That's okay. Jeez. Okay. Sorry. No worries. This is life, Rick. It's all good. <laughs> Everybody has to blow their nose. So yeah. So let's uh, let's hear one of your poems. This is okay. Awesome. So the one I picked up for uh, you because you mentioned soapbox sermonettes. I think this is from that chapter. This is one called Tail Wags the Dog. Now, when I was writing this stuff, just, uh, I should you know, give some background. Donald Trump was the president of the United States and I was not happy. Right. <laughs> you know, like yep. that to me, that's like as bad as bad can get yep. in terms of this whole thing of vanity versus humility. Right. Which informed a lot of the things that I was writing. Right. So this one is sort of, you know, me pontificating about the, the state of the world. It's called Tail Wags the Dog. All right. Okay. It's a world of spin doctors, handlers, media consultants, publicists, 
managers of managers of managers. The tail wags the dog and has been doing it for so long now, there really isn't any dog to speak of anymore. Everything that goes public is geared towards life support for the tail. There used to be a political system and the media covered it. Now politics is a snake pit of dysfunction and the media systematically gets in our face. McLuhan was an oracle. The medium is the message. The media covers the media and analyzes their own coverage. And who owns the media? The telecoms, the multinational conglomerates, the four horsemen of technology and their corporate minions. It's a miracle if anything approaching reality, anything approaching real work or real solid social contract activity actually gets accomplished or even exposed once the digital universe has assimilated the information. Public service has been polluted by public relations. Journalism struggles and increasingly fails against the prevailing global social conditions dictated by technology. Return a profit to the shareholders of a very small division of your media conglomerate corporation's bottom line. The bottom line is all tail. Holy shit. Were you uh, looking on my Facebook? Because I, <laughs> well, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, and that's that's the way I am. I know for a fact that Silicon Valley runs the media. There's only about four major companies in the world that own about 95% of the media we see. They don't report anymore. They read scripts. And um, it's you have to dig into independent uh, media to find out what's really going on. Yeah, and the, the the danger there, of course, is that you know people end up siloing. They, they, the independent media that they start to look at is what is what they want to hear. Is what they you know it's it's not necessarily the truth mm. because you know, and that's why you get all these people at Trump rallies that you know they, they believe that the you know I don't know drinking bleach is going to help you get rid of COVID, and you go yeah. okay, you know whatever happened to uh, you know, a, a media that would deliver something that had been properly researched and you know, qualified and quantified. And yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have that kind of a world anymore. And it's and, you know, much to our regret. Um, but that's not to say that it, it, you know, it doesn't exist, that mm -hmm. realities don't exist. You know, uh, I, I do believe that, that culturally we have a pendulum and it swings, you know, and, and uh, what we're always seeking is the balance, the, 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 the center point that it gives us balance. Right. Unfortunately, sometimes the pendulum now swings, you know, so extreme and then people go, no, I like it over here. I like it way over here on the far right or the far left. Yeah. And I don't want to have to leave. I'm going to stay here. And you go, yeah, but if you're going to meet, uh, uh, a social contract we all have to sort of try and find the balance points this yeah. the center of things is is what matters and i'm not necessarily suggesting that everybody has to inhabit the middle of the road i'm yeah. not suggesting that for a second but uh i am suggesting that from a a, a, a perspective of, of uh the po political choices we make we do have to try and figure out how we're going to get along. And Canadians generally have been better at it than Americans yeah. because Americans do tend to silo more just because, I mean, there's a million reasons why they, they're they a, a culture that was based on rebellion. <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody's got to own a gun and they still have that so deeply ingrained in their, in their cultural character yeah. that, you know, uh, and we don't have that so much. Ours is more about, uh, geez, you know, uh, it's really cold out there. Have you got your mittens on? <laughs> you yeah, know, we're, we're past Do you need it. to borrow a scarf? You know? Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, that was a great poem, Rick. That was really nice. Um, Thank you. Before I let you go, uh, I've got a couple of things to ask. Um, coffee or tea? Oh, I'm a tea guy. Although I, you know, I, I, I don't mind a, a nice cup of decaf every now and then, but I'm a very much a decaf kind of guy now in my life. 
There's no caffeine. I actually had last night um, chaga. I, I drink chaga, but um, oh, yeah. I got a chalk because chaga, as you know, is flavorless. But uh -huh. I got a chocolate mint chaga, and I'm not even a chocolate mint fan, but it was something to uh, little things get me excited these days. So I had a chocolate <laughs> mint chaga last night. It was really great. But I'm a, I'm a coffee guy in the morning and uh, tea guy at night. Um, hockey, okay, and I want you to be honest, okay? Yes. Um, the Toronto Maple Leafs or um, the Sioux Greyhounds? Oh, geez. Well, there's there's connective tissue now, eh? Because yeah, of Kyle. Be and, and honest. Yes or no, one or the other. You can't play the middle road. Uh, okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go Leafs. I wasn't born in the Sioux. Oh, sorry. Just, you, you, just know. Lost, you just lost it, a lot of fans there. I right? know. I know. But if I had been born there, then I would be a Sioux guy, you know. Uh, but uh, no, I'm I'm sorry. I'm a Toronto guy. You know, well, half the, half the Leafs right now are from the Sioux, anyways. You got Dubis. You got well, not from the Sioux, but they have affiliation. You have Kyle Dubis. You have yeah. got Sheldon Keith. You got Sandine. Yeah. So I mean, so you're. Yeah. There, there's a guy. There's a new guy this year who's literally born in the Sioux. One of the new players. I can't remember his name now, but he's he's literally was from the Sioux Greyhound, but he was also born there. I think. I'm gonna have to research that because I'm. To be honest with you, Rick, I haven't followed the NHL for years. I find that a lot of the players are jaded and all the, the salaries and stuff. But I do yeah. love junior hockey. Yeah, they haven't reached. Well, that you point. got your Greyhounds, of course. Maybe the guy was from the jet from the Sioux Greyhounds as opposed to born there. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I watched some of the game last night. You know, they beat the Canadians two one, and, and uh, the. the the Swedish guy, he, he uh, got a nice goal. Rasmus? Uh, no, no, the, the forward that they pay all the money for. Oh, Oops. yeah. Come well, on, who is it? My mother he, watches it. She yeah. knows more hockey lingo in the NHL than I do. It's ridiculous. Nylander. William Nylander. 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 Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, my, my brain is is a little bit slower than it normally would be. Because no, no, your, your, your neurons are firing. It's all it's right. It's congested. I can't. I've got, I've got pressure. I couldn't remember William Nylander. That's okay. okay. Um, upcoming um, guitar players, Canadian-wise, that you would say that are, are getting big. Now, I have to exclude myself because, as you know, I do play a little guitar. Okay. Very um, little. Okay. So is there anybody out there that uh, that's uh, on the radar right now? Uh, I can't say... Uh, Yes, because I haven't, I've been buried so deep that I, I haven't been paying much attention. Uh, there are guys that uh, I love dearly uh, that are uh, sort of jazz players and stuff. I'm going to mention a few names. There's a guy named Nathan Whitney, who's okay. now touring with uh, Thomas Wade in the States. And okay. he was a student of mine at Humber. And, he, you know, <clears throat> he's not a young guy anymore. He's, you know, married with a kid. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I always loved Nathan's guitar playing, and uh, he's a great musician. And, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll throw that one out there. I, I, I won't go too, too much into depth. Like, I, I could name jazz guys and stuff, and then you, your people that watch your thing are going to be going, who is that? I don't even know who that is. Well, one of my favorite <laughs> jazz kind of players is actually Brian Setzer. Oh, yeah. But he's not. Yeah, well, he... Yeah, he's got some jazz in him. He's more of that rockabilly kind of yeah. swing, yeah. you know, yeah. like like a jump. He's more like a jump guitar player okay. in terms of jazz. You know the jump arrow like Louis Jordan and the Jordanaires and, you know. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, jump was, uh, it, it was a sort of a, um, in the early 50s, there, there was this uh, trend, like uh, rockabilly was just maybe starting to happen. Uh, you see, you hadn't got to Chuck Berry yet, right? But like, there was like Louis Jordan and the Jordanaires, and they were a, it was it was literally called jump music, and it was kind of like jazz, but it was kind of heading towards it was still swinging, but uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it wasn't a bop because bop was much more serious. Yeah. So, uh, jump had a kind of a a fun nature to it. Do you remember uh, David Lee Roth did a tune? Just a gigolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah everywhere yeah. I go. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of jump era stuff. Okay, that that it was had a novelty kind of quality to it. 
Yeah, but David actually just announced his retirement. Did he? Yeah, he's hung up, uh, well, whatever a singer hangs up, I guess, the microphone. <laughs> In his case, the uh, assless, the, the, the cheekless uh, chaps. Actually, funny story really quick. <clears throat> I saw him playing uh, at Kuwait in Sioux, Michigan. Uh, he did a solo show there a few years ago, and he was into bluegrass at the time. And he was literally singing for all these Van Halen fans, uh, jump bluegrass style. It was, uh, it was. I tell you, you walk out of there and you think, is this a dream? Yeah, it was insane. Uh, I like to fall. Go ahead. Uh, well, he, Dave was always a sort of an unchained, unfettered. Like he, he didn't have a. Yeah, yeah he, he didn't really have a lot. He was not afraid to uh, be a class clown on a level where. He was definitely going to just head on out there. But when he was a teenager, he liked like that jump era stuff. Mm -hmm. He he liked that stuff a lot. And he was a fan of that. Really? Uh, and his dad had, had played a lot of that music when he uh, when he was growing up. So that was why there were little moments like, you know, uh, like I said, that just a jiggle thing that the remake that he did. Yeah. Uh, it was because he, he loved that era of stuff. So. Yeah, he was always a bit of a strange character. I remember there was a time where uh, he he retired from from touring and he became like a a, a a medic. He was driving in a in an emergency vehicle. I heard that. And, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like, strange guy, you know. He, he, clearly, he would have uh, hear callings that you know perhaps uh, yeah. others of us might go. Mm, that's. It's a little too weird for me. I don't know if I'm going to go down there. Never be road. bored in his presence, I'm sure. I, I'm sure of that. Hey, I'd like to thank you, Rick, for your gracious time um, and everybody watching here across Canada. Just, just great uh, to see you and uh, hear what you're doing. I got a question for you. Are you sitting? Are you sitting on like a stool? I'm sitting on a chair, like an old dining room chair. I got a question for you. Uh, and I see that there's no excuse behind you. Is there any way you can grab a guitar, sit back a bit, and do Midsummer's Day? <laughs> okay.